So I'm delighted to introduce now our final speaker um, of the individual sessions. This is Dr. Tim Holt at the University of Oxford. He's also a general practitioner in London, and he will be speaking on sailing close to the wind, models and metaphors for the self-management of diabetes. So uh, thanks very much. I'm absolutely delighted to be here at the end of this really fascinating conference. Um, my name is Tim Holt. I'm a, um, an academic GP. It would be quite wrong of me, after everything that's been said about patient perspectives, to uh, hide it from you that I've also um, had uh, type 1 diabetes for over 40 years. So I bring a little bit of patient perspective into this, but I want to make it clear, first of all, that this isn't a talk by someone with diabetes. I am somebody who's doing research in a supportive way to other people who are leading the research, because as well as contributing positive um, benefits from um, patient involvement, there's also uh, some risk of bias there. So I think it's very important that I don't want you to feel that I am saying uh, at any point in this presentation that you've got to believe me because I know it from the patient side. However, I do think that um, models and metaphors are very powerful things at um, conveying understanding and concepts. And so I hope you'll find what I have to say interesting. I'm going to go through some of the models and metaphors that I've developed in collaboration with others and some of the research that's result resulted from that. Um, that has, is ho hopefully going to help people to self-manage their diabetes. So I'm going to start the story um, back in Toronto, 1921. You might recognize these two characters, Frederick Banting and Charles Best, um, and one of their dogs, who at the time they were doing experiments um, on dogs, and in doing so, they, they had use for laboratory during the summer of 1921, and by the end of it, they had succeeded in um, developing a pancreatic extract, which when in, uh, injected into a dog with experimentally induced diabetes, reduced the blood uh, glucose levels. That pancreatic extract, of course, became insulin, which was then mass-produced to a global population, um, including people who were dying of type 1 um, diabetes. And you can see the, um, you can see the smile on the, uh, Charles Best's face, because it, the story goes that he won the toss of a coin with another PhD student to join Frederick Banting in this piece of work during that summer, which resulted in both of them sharing the Nobel Prize. So um, for those of us who, in the audience who aren't uh, clinicians, I ought to just explain a little bit about diabetes. Uh, it's a condition where insulin production either is um, reduced completely, uh, fails completely, as in type 1 diabetes, which is an autoimmune condition with onset usually early in life, and always requires insulin from the onset, insulin injections or infusions. And type 2 diabetes, where there is still a failure to meet the insulin production demand, but this is partly because of this other component, which is in resistance to the insulin, and this is associated with obesity and inactivity, and also, I have to say, genetic factors. Um, insulin is not needed at the onset, but may well be needed at a later stage, when other treatments, including oral therapies, um, no longer are effective. So um, in the case particularly of insulin treated patients, but this also applies to anyone really with diabetes, there's a need to control those blood glucose levels to an adequate level. But the problem is that the target range, the normal range of blood glucose levels, let's say it's between four and seven, is actually very close to the low range where um, the blood glucose might fall below four and it then becomes a danger. And if it goes below three or particularly goes below two, then the person might actually become unconscious. So hypoglycemia, where the blood glucose level is too low, is a dangerous thing and has to be avoided. So this gives us a bit of a dilemma because um, the patient has got to aim for blood glucose levels which are actually close to a dangerous level. Um, and therefore, um, they have to sail close to the wind. My question is, how do we help them to do that in a way which is safe? Because it's very easy to reduce blood glucose levels generally just by increasing the doses of medication, particularly insulin. But if, that, if we do that, then um, of course it's going to dip low, unless there's no variation at all, which is unrealistic. It's bound to dip low at times. and. Um, then put them at risk of hypoglycemia. 
Now, when um, Bantic and, and Best first started injecting their dogs with diabetes and reducing their blood glucose levels, I mean, this was quite miraculous. And there's a, a famous um, scene from the history of medicine where Banting and Best and the biochemist Collett uh, went round the war, a war full of uh, children who were dying of type 1 diabetes. They were sort of in a coma um, and started injecting them with insulin. And by the time they got to the last child, the first children were starting to wake up. It's one of those fantastic sort of scenes. And you can imagine at that time that this was a sufficient, um, sufficiently miraculous that they were a little way off actually achieving what is required for a more persistent, more consistent um, avoidance of the complications of diabetes. Because if the blood glucose levels are not controlled sufficiently, then um, the chances of the person developing complications, as we heard a minute ago, um, blindness, uh, kidney damage, amputations, these are significantly increased if the blood glucose levels are not controlled. So, um, as the 20th century went on, um, as it was recognized, as well as the insulin that was needed, that was the bit that was missing when it was discovered, there was another almost, exact, or almost as important factor missing, which of course is the control mechanism which matches insulin um, requirements to insulin de delivery. So the modern patient trying to sail close to the wind has got to match their insulin requirement to their, to their, <coughs> sorry, their insulin dose to their insulin requirement on an hour to hour basis to do this safely. Now the, these are two blood glucose profiles from a um, project which I'm going to talk a little bit about. Um, and I want to just explain. So each of these, these are two different patients. And each line is 24 hours of blood glucose levels that have been monitored by a subcutaneous probe every five minutes. So we've got quite a fine-grained look at the dynamical properties here. And the different colours are simply different days that have been superimposed on top of each other, which tends to bring out visually any sort of patterns that have recurred on each of the days. But the striking thing about these two um, Profiles, but they look quite different from a distance, don't they? And yet, the marker of control that we use most commonly in practice, which is the HbA1c, this is a reflection of the, of the mean blood glucose level over two to three months. So, if you looked at these two profiles and you looked at the people's HbA1c, you would conclude from the HbA1c that they were similarly well controlled. And the problem is, is that this marker that um, on which we base our um, assessment over whether somebody is well controlled or not um, gives us absolutely no clue to the dynamical variability. So we set out to do this project to better understand these dynamical properties and um, to see if, first of all, you know, to study, first of all, does it matter whether the variation is one particular characteristic or another, but also can an understanding of these dynamical properties actually help people to safely reduce their HbA1c without going hypo too often, because that's the challenge. So the overall aim of the research was to develop a, an improved understanding and definition of blood glucose stability from a dynamical perspective. Now you could ask, what do we mean by stability? Um, and in diabetes, it certainly means that the um, average level is reasonable. It certainly means that the variation isn't too wide, so it's not going too high or too low too often. But I think the other thing um, from a dynamical systems point of view that it matters, that, that it means, is that the system is resilient to, to disruption. To me, that is very much part of what stability means. It means that if the system is knocked out of place, it can recover and it's resilient to it. That's because from a day-to-day -day point of view, that those sorts of disruptions are happening very often. Now, Back in 2001, I was asked to contribute to this series in the British Medical Journal, which was talking about the role of complexity science, the potential for complexity science, uh, which was quite a new thing then, uh, to influence healthcare organisation, clinical medicine, and um, clinical education. So we wrote four, like, four articles 
And this has been a very, very well, well cited se um, series of articles. I had a message um, from ResearchGate a couple of weeks ago that this article had been um, cited two, over 200 times, and, that, and that's just the ones that ResearchGate knows about. So it, it's at times when the research has been, you know, we've been struggling to get funding and things, it's sort of, I've reminded myself that this does actually strike a chord with other people as well. Um, so what did we say in that article? Well, part of it was um, about diabetes, and we made this point about the limitations of HbA1c. Um, we made the point that the blood glucose profiles that clinicians study when they are uh, with the patient are just a sort of one-dimensional slice through what is actually a multi-dimensional problem because the um, patient will be aware of other facts and the other factors that influence their blood glucose. <coughs> and whilst there are quite a number of them, most of the dynamical behavior can boil down to just a few factors, including carbohydrate intake, exercise level, and insulin uh, level in the bloodstream. And those things are, by and large, under the control of the individual. <coughs> so, um, just to give you one model to think about, imagine we've got a bowl um, with a, a, a round surface. Imagine we're looking at it from the side, and we have a marble in the bottom of it. There is um, a point at the bottom of the ball where the, um, the marble will continue, to, will, will tend to um, settle. So this is a stable equilibrium, because if you nudge the system, if you disrupt it, it will fall back to that stable equilibrium point. Now if we um, make the bowl less curved, or even flat, then that stability is lost. And then if we then turn the bowl upside down, in this extreme case here, there still isn't an equilibrium point there. You still could put the marble at the top of it, <coughs> but it would be a very unstable equilibrium. So one of the uh, motivations in this research is to see whether we can develop ways, if you like, in diabetes of measuring the concavity or convexity of the individual's pole, if you like. I hope that makes some sense. Going into higher dimensions, I was very um, struck by the models used, you know, and I've read quite a lot about this, um, models used towards the end of the 20th century to represent systems in state space. I don't know whether you're familiar with that idea, but essentially if you have a system which you, in which you can measure a number of different uh, parameters that describe it, you can plot the current state of the system in that space. So imagine this is a three-dimensional um, space. But I could say it could in, indeed have any number of, um, of uh, axes. We can only visualize three. Then as time goes by, the values of these variables changes, and the system moves as a trajectory through state space. Now somebody could um, study the range of values of x, y, and z. They could <coughs> measure the mean value measure the standard deviation, but that would give them no real clue over the dynamical properties of the system. Because what we're wanting to know is what are the geometrical properties of this trajectory? How does the system move from one state to the next? So there's loads of examples from all areas of science of the use of these diagrams. I'm thinking of particularly ecological uh, examples like this might be um, the population of foxes, rabbits, and hawks. So you might know the mean uh, pop population number for rabbits over time, the standard deviation, and the same for the other species. But what you're interested to know is how are they influencing each other and how does the system evolve over time? And again, we could have any number of um, variables. A computer can handle that higher dimensionality. So my idea was that, in fact, this made sense if we um, plotted blood glucose and its major determinants in such a plot. And this would give us a more adequate multidimensional model that we could study <coughs> if we had sufficient data. Now, what sort of patterns might we see? Well, a rather like the bottom of the bowl, um, one op possibility is the point attractor, where there are sort of preferred values for all these variables. And 
up until the sort of seventies and eighties, it was often believed that in nature, nature is sort of in balance and therefore the system is going to return to some sort of attractive point. But in fact, it was discovered, particularly in those ecological type examples, that um, the whole system is far more dynamic than that, and that actually it's continually moving. So whilst there might be a stable point attractor situation, it's just as likely that perhaps there's a periodic um, behavior going on where a recurrent movement through a sequence of value combinations of the system variables occurs. So that's periodic behavior. Now, the other thing that's important from a stability point of view is how sensitive is the system to the initial conditions. So imagine we have um, the current state of the system or on a different at a different time, an alternative state of the system, will, this will these two points, if they're close to each other, move in similar directions, as you would expect if you are adequately um, describing the system through those variables <coughs> and if you are protecting the, the system from external disruption? Because one possibility is that they do indeed run in parallel. Another is that they converge, rather like in the bowl, to the attracting point. But another is that they are actually divergent, and this is a hallmark of um, chaotic systems in the true meaning of that term that's used by mathematicians. And you can actually measure this tendency uh, if you have sufficient data. So uh, I'll just show you this in case it interests you. Um, this is one of the things that came from um, the Journal of the Atmospheric Sciences in 1963. It was arguably one of the big papers of the 20th century because this was Edward Laurent, who was a Harvard meteorologist, and through developing what became known as the Laurent's attractor, he demonstrated what we now know to be the issue over weather prediction, and the fact that however, however hard you try to measure the initial conditions of a weather system, there's going to be a limit to the predictive time horizon. So we're much better now than we were in the 60s at deciding whether it's going to be, um, you know, what the weather's going to be like in four or five days' time, but we're not much better at saying what it's going to be like in two or three weeks' time. So, just to give you an if I can connect to this. If I click on that box, you'll see that this is the trajectory of a system, which is determined by in, in a very simple way, mathematically, by only three equations, you put in the variable, imagine this is in three dimensions, you put in those x, y, z values into the equations, and the, the product is the next point. You then put those, um, uh, the values of the new um, variable values to give you the next point, and again, and again, and again. And you see that that's what you get, and, which is this butterfly attractor. And if you start anywhere on this system, you will get the same pattern emerging. However, every single butterfly that I've just produced then is unique. But nevertheless, it has the same structure. And just to demonstrate the sensitivity to initial conditions, if I click twice and try and start on the same point, you'll see that these two lines do indeed start off going in the same uh, direction, which distinguishes them simply from random variation. But over time, they are going to start diverging. And because that's going to take too long, I'm going to, I'm going to start on more different, more differently than that. But however hard I try to, to press on the same spot twice, tiny vibration in my finger will result in different traje trajectories. And you can see these are now starting to move further apart from each other, and there we are, they're on, the ring, they're on different sides now. So just to continue, um, we're moving further towards metaphors for balance and models for balance, which recognize the multidimensional um, aspects of blood glucose control. And um, in the 70s and 80s, the 
weighing scales was a very common metaphor for balance in diabetes. You were weighing up carbohydrate intake versus insulin dose, or you were weighing up exercise versus carbohydrate intake, and it was like a two-way thing. Whereas another way of looking at it is um, the Snoopy Q balancing uh, model, where you can see that it is possible, actually, to balance Snoopy Q in sort of three dimensions, provided the person who's doing the balancing is responding appropriately to the displacements of the cube, because there's another sort of movement that goes like this. Okay, now can you see that in both cases, the cube does remain r roughly upright, but in the first case, you're going to be much more likely to um, stay upright, imagine somebody opens the door and a breeze comes through. There's also, going back to the unstable equilibrium, the possibility of standing the cue on a table. And you could say that that is, in a sense, the modern sort of clinician sense of view of stabilizing diabetes is to get everything accurately balanced. So the carbohydrate intake is balanced to insulin dose. But if you, it relies on there being a stable baseline. And if you were doing, if you're trying to balance this cue and you're on the deck of the ship, you would um, be much more likely to keep it upright if you had it on your finger than you would if you had it on the desk. Now, the driverless train is, a, is uh, another um, metaphor that I like to think about. Um, we're getting on driverless trains increasingly these days, aren't we? This is the DLR. Um, and you know, a few years ago, you would have questioned whether that was safe to do so. Um, but it appears to be so. The train is programmed to go through a series of pre-specified movements. And um, because it's running on rails, then you know that it will get to the other, you know, the other end of the line safely. So in the case of the patient who is trying to get through the day with getting their insulin doses correct for their carbohydrate intake, if this is a person who is having regular meals and is eating the same amount of carbohydrate every day at the same time, then it may well indeed be possible for them to select their insulin doses to meet the, that requirement because they're, they're a train rather than a car. But if they are somebody whose landscape is quite different and they have different demands which are less predictable, they have no um, uh, regularity in their eating pattern, then they are more likely to, they're more like the Google car. And of course the Google car requires an awful lot more in terms of sensing the data around about its environment and responding appropriately. So in order to create a driverless car, it took an awful lot more programming technology than a train. And in the case of the patient, the equivalent of that programming technology is itself is the education of the patient in responding appropriately to self-monitoring. Because I remember a patient saying to me some time ago um, about managing their diabetes that it's like going through a room that's full of furniture and you're allowed to, and it's pitch dark, and you're allowed to get to switch the light on two or three times during your journey through the, through the um, room. Now, um, the switching the light on is equivalent, I guess, to um, self-monitoring of blood glucose and sensing symptoms that go along with it that help you navigate. But the point is, it is a navigational process. And if you don't get it right, then you'll get bruised knees. And of course, in some people's cases, the every day the room is the same and they get used to where that furniture is. In other, for other patients, the, the um, furniture is moving every day. That's, that's the difference. So let's have a look, another look at another profile. Um, so these are glucose measurements as time goes by. And you can see some interesting things happening here. In all three days here, the level during the night and the early hours has dropped below 3.9, which is identified here as being you know, too low. So each, each day that's happened. And each day it's gone up too high during the morning. So it's likely, looking at this profile, that you could say that almost, this is somebody who's taking insulin, almost certainly they are getting too much here and the 
resulting in the game low during the night. And they are either overcorrecting it because they are feeling hypoglycemic here, overcorrecting their blood glucose and it's going too high, or they're simply not having enough insulin here with breakfast. So in this case, there's a periodic feature in the data which can enable the patient or the clinician to look retrospectively back at the profile and make a decision over adjusting their insulin dose. The other thing you should just notice here is that at bedtime, these two are moving downwards, but this red one really is, and it's difficult to, it would have been difficult to predict that based on the glucose levels alone, that that red one was going to end up going low. That red one becomes this green one on this side. So it also goes low. But in fact, it's quite stable here. So these are the difficulties. And the, the problem is that it's not just the glucose levels that determine the future behavior. You've got to take into consideration the other factors. So this person at night you know, may be aware that actually they've had more insulin than they needed to to cover their evening meal. And that's why they can predict that it's going to go down lower later on. Okay, so um, we have the situation where we're encouraging people who take insulin to monitor, self-monitor, have their finger, measure their blood glucose, um, perhaps several times a day, certainly in the case of type 1 patients. Um, and this process has the potential to be extremely beneficial, provided, like with the snooker cue, they are responding appropriately to those signals. If they're not, then they will do you know, what engineers refer to as tampering, making the system worse, make, making the whole um, dynamics worse rather than better. So um, blood glucose levels lead to an awareness, and the symptoms, of course, do as well. Those lead on to decisions, actions, behavior, over carbohydrate intake, exercise, insulin doses, and those feed back to the, to the blood glucose levels. So it's a cyclical pattern which could be either um, stabilizing or destabilizing. I also say that the, um, the symptoms might be hypo symptoms because very often people feel ill if their blood glucose goes too low. It's actually quite a serious problem if they don't feel unwell because that's part of the mechanism that alerts them that they need to do something. But people probably vary quite significantly in their ability to guess what their blood glucose is uh, when it's not low because really they, you know, there are no symptoms up until it gets really very high. So that will be an interesting piece of research to do, to see how people vary and whether they can get... And, it, and they won't be guessing based on how they feel, probably. They'll be guessing on the basis of, you know, I know my blood glucose four hours ago was this, I know what I've eaten, and I know how much insulin I've had and when. So they have a sort of mental model over where this is, how the system is uh, developing over time as a trajectory. Uh, one of the um, risks of measuring blood glucose, um, <coughs> if you like, prospectively managing blood glucose, so one um, approach, which is, uh, has until recently been the standard approach, you could call the retrospective approach, like I described earlier, the patient or the clinician or both together examine a retrospective um, profile and they decide based on recurring patterns whether there are areas of the day that are not adequately covered by insulin. So they adjust the insulin doses in response to a retrospective analysis of the data. But that, of course, is not why patients do it. That's not the only reason that patients do it. It is a valuable exercise to do that, but patients are also looking forward. They're measuring their blood glucose in order to decide over the future few hours how they're going to um, what they're going to eat, how much insulin they're going to take. Um, and chasing the tail is a sort of disparaging um, uh, name given for the quite common phenomenon where because they are not skillful enough at balancing the cue, they are um, overcorrecting. So they're um, responding to displacements in their blood glucose by overcorrecting in either direction. And of course, those over displacements require further correction, which over displaces it again. So, um, comparing the retrospective approach, which is very sort of doctor centered, really, with the prospective approach, um, which is patient centered, you know, we just have to recognize that um, 
no, no good driver will attempt to drive a car without using both. If you literally are trying to drive a car looking through the rear view mirror, you are only learning from the disasters you're leaving behind you. And that's <coughs> worth something. But it's not worth as much as looking forward as well. Okay, so just the last bit, I'd like to just give you some of the results of some of the um, some of the results that have emerged from our project so far. We enrolled 15 volunteers, um, I think five with type two, um, five with um, type one, and five controls who don't have diabetes. And we got them to put on one of these monitors to monitor over 72 hours of um, every five minute glucose data. And what we thought we were interested in was um, measuring the autocorrelation. So just to describe that to you um, briefly, um, there was originally a paper where somebody had measured blood glucose in an individual twice a day for what, about six months. And one of the interesting things that they observed in their report was that when they compared the morning values with the, with the uh, evening values, there was no correlation at all between the two which surprised them and also surprised me because going back to what I think Veronica was saying about um, people having bad days and good days, if a person with diabetes has run into a bad patch where their blood glucose might be raised for several days and then they have a good patch where it's well behaved and they have patches that go on for several days long, and I certainly have people telling me that when you know, I talk to them, then you would expect there to be some preservation of that memory some there would be you would expect there to be um, correlation over um, 12 hours. So the question is, um, if my blood glucose is high now and I measure it again in five minutes, it's very very likely to still be high, a higher than average value for me. That's uncontroversial. You expect two values separated by only five minutes to be highly <coughs> correlated. But how about an hour? How about six hours? Is it would, would you still expect it to be correlated? And this is a, um, a parameter which is relatively easy to measure now and might be relevant to uh, measuring the smoothness of fluctuation and therefore possibly the skill of the individual in moving from one state to another through time. So if we look at what we can measure, this is um, an autocorrelation function. So this every each of these columns is a lag of five minutes, okay? And this is the correlation and the way it decays over time. So after five minutes, indeed, you expect a very high correlation here to the right, and then it falls off over time. And if you were to take a random number sequence, or imagine you were to take your profile of three days worth of every five minute glucose values, and jumble them all up randomly. Imagine you did that. You would still have the same mean value, you'd have the same standard deviation, you'd have the same proportion of values that were outside a range that you specified, but you would have lost all the information about how one state was connected with the other. And all the information that you would lose in that jumbling up process is what we're interested in in this, pro in this project. So that's the autocorrelation function that you would expect from a random number sequence. So, we can measure the correlation of the first time lag, we can measure the gradient and shape of the initial decay, we can specify a time interval of two hours, say compare profiles according to where the correlation is at that time, um, or the number of time lags before it's dropped to a certain value. Or we can indeed decide of how long it takes to get to a non-significant value. And one of the results that, we, that came out of this is that when we looked at patients with diabetes versus patients without diabetes, the people with diabetes have this characteristically concave, uh, sorry, convex shape there, and people without diabetes have concave shape, which is quite interesting, suggesting that um, these people had a greater uh, fall off of their autocorrelation. Now, that was an visual impression initially, um, so we had to look into it further with more uh, detailed analysis. This is, um, I'll show you that in a moment, 
And this is looking at that profile I showed you earlier, where you see the period, the periodic features. And when we did the autocorrelation function of that profile, this popped out, which was a rather nice diagram. I remember my excitement when I first saw the <coughs> diagram. Um, so this, these lengths have taken over a longer time scale. And the autocorrelation falls off, and it then repeats itself, because this, this is the 24-hour periodicity. So if you imagine that the values that are high in that profile, if the value is high, then 24 hours later it's probably going to be high as well. That's what it's measuring. So one of the possible benefits of this is that it might expose a period <coughs> that isn't that evident in looking at the visual profile. Because there's another 12-hour periodicity there that you might not have noticed. Better still, we then took this profile, which was taken using a different device. Now this one measures um, the blood glucose every three minutes for 48 hours. And we got this very, very variable results. And it's initially, we were very excited that we sort of uncovered the complexity of blood glucose dynamics and look how fantastic it is. But when we um, did the autocorrelation function on it, we see that the ACF value at the first time like is only 0.6. In other words, we were able to show that about 40% of the variation in that profile was due to measurement error. And that's quite an insight because most of these devices have, are sort of validated using a different source of data. So in other words, if they attach another device to the same patient at the same time, or they get fingerprint messages or blood mes uh, measurements to decide whether the um, device is functioning well. But this enabled us with only this, only that existing data set, because essentially at the first time lag, you're for every single measurement, you're comparing it with the one next door to see, and they should be highly correlated. And if they're not, then there's a component of random noise in the system, measurement error. So that was useful. These were initial results, and I won't, I'll only just point out that we managed to demonstrate this difference concavity or convexity in the profiles of people with diabetes um, on the controls. Um, further analysis confirmed that still we developed this, um, this um, gamma um, parameter which is the initial gradient of those ACF profiles and the controls have higher values. Um, we also developed uh, another um, uh, alpha component from the detrend of fluctuation analysis, which I won't go into. There's another way of measuring the sort of smoothness of the profiles. The other interesting thing that's come out is that when we fit the curve to the profile, we find that in some cases it's easy to fit a line. This is a, a, a standard equation for fitting uh, a linear um, response curve. Um, and we found that some uh, people had profiles that were easy to fit, and the others like in this case, were not fitted at all well. And this is another indication of the complexity of people's dynamics uh, difference between individuals. The other thing that comes out of this is that the baseline on which these mealtime excursions are occurring is variable, another indication that this is a moving system. Finally, I'm finishing now, um, just one more uh, sort of metaphor, if you like. You may have heard it said that you know, a tiny desk is the sign of a sick mind. And I sometimes have a comfort myself with that because my desk is particularly tidy. But I think there's um, a more important point about um, imagine you have a desk like this where you are continually doing a job, clearing it, returning to what is an equilibrium state, if you like, a static state, and then you're taking on another job and you're completing it, clearing your desk again. It's quite possible to do that, but most of us are more productive if we have several jobs going on at the same time, aren't we? Um, and therefore, in a sense, we are working in a position away from that equilibrium state. We don't want to be in this situation, but what we want is to sort of a reasonable level of order that is a compromise between that over-orderly state um, and, and this mess, because that's usually where the most productive point is in the system. So that's relevant to diabetes because one of the challenges for, manage for insulin management is that meal times are supposed to be discrete events that, that you take rapid acting insulin to cover each meal. The problem is, first of all, the baseline isn't always stable. And secondly, these discrete events overlap. 
like the jobs on the desk do, and therefore the skill of the patient is required to determine how much insulin they need in that much more dynamic and complicated situation. So finally, um, emerging research questions, what measures of smoothness, do they, are they important? Um, can they help us? Um, you could take the view that uh, going back to the sailing close to the wind metaphor, you want to have stable behavior. On the other hand, you also need to be able to suddenly um, change course if you go high when you're going too low. So um, as well as one, perhaps wanting an oil tanker behavior at some times, you also want to be a speedboat at other times. Um, can um, these smoothness parameters predict and prevent hypoglycemia? Um, which type 2 patients benefit most from self-monitoring? Because it's uncontroversial that insulin taking patients, including all type 1 patients, should self-monitor frequently, uh, regularly. But in type 2 diabetes, in the early stages, they are effectively uh, around bowel and displacement are likely to return back to normal. So there's much less of a case for um, self-monitoring. Could we use these techniques to help determine fitness to drive a heavy, heavy goods vehicle because that's now possible for an insulin treated person to get an HGV license? They have to go along to a diabetologist and have um, provide three months of self monitored blood glucose data, but there's potential there for you know um, them to you know not check their blood glucose when they're hypo, for instance. It might be possible for these techniques to demonstrate and reassure us in addition to that process that they, um, that they are stable. What are the effects of educational interventions on diabetes <coughs> mental stability? Um, can we detect risk of diabetes before blood glucose levels have actually risen? Because type 2 diabetes is a, a gradual onset process. So it's possible that we might be able to detect and there's signs from our most recent work that that might be possible. And finally, can we, this is the real goal, can these techniques design the, uh, inform the design of the artificial pancreas? Because this is the real challenge. You know, you can develop a, a device which measures the blood glucose and also delivers insulin. But the problem with it, the, the main obstacle to it, is that um, there's, a lag, there's a time lag between the blood glucose changing the subcutaneous blood glucose changing, and any subcutaneous insulin actually having an effect on the blood glucose. So knowing um, the difference between variation that we have to take account of and act on, that the device has to act on, or is safe to ignore, is possibly as important for the device as it is for the individual. So I've discussed um, those models and um, metaphors I hope you found them interesting. I'd like to finish by thanking all the patients I've come across from which were the main source of, of my insights and also <coughs> my academic colleagues at the University of Warwick um, and Oxford. And those are three um, publications that have come out so far. Thank you very much. Fantastic, thank you. So what I propose we do is we take uh, 15 minutes of questions on this session and then we'd have 15 minutes left for a brief uh, plenary question session. So if we'd like to get us in the right show. So I was interested in your um, uh, retrospective, you know, track record way of looking at how the um, blood glucose is evolving. And you mentioned that the retrospective and the prospective um, can't drive a car just looking in the rearview mirror. But doesn't it seem that you're learning different things when you're looking retrospectively and prospectively? Like um, the retrospective is telling you, um, in a, in a general sense, how well certain policy is doing. But the, prospectively, you can see that oh, there's an obstruction in the road right yes. there. So more specific things. Is there? So can the two be used in a complementary way? Well, that, that's, that's my point. You know, if you're driving a car, you, you wouldn't want to drive a car without being able to do both simultaneously. And I think, if, you know, I don't, um, I don't want to sound as if I'm being at all negative about the retrospective approach. But you know, if you find you know textbooks of um, 15 years ago, even, uh, not that long ago, uh, would say that the prospective approach was dangerous. And, chasing the tail and 
you know, the only safe way of adjusting doses um, is to retrospectively look for consistent patterns. And that's the more adequate basis. But modern people who have um, very variable lives are bound to want to enable their blood glucose measurements to influence what they do next, what they do right now. And that's important, actually, to avoid hypos. Yeah, you know, if somebody is you know, about to give themselves their usual insulin dose before the meal, but in fact the blood glucose is lower than they expect it to be, it's very important that they do um, respond to that. Yeah. So, so how, how is chasing the tail avoided? How does a patient learn how to do that? Well, I think it's, um, I think it's the sort of thing that you can't give a, a single script to every individual that will work for them. I think you need to point out the um, dangers of it. But one, one very simple thing is that people will correct um, hypo by taking carbohydrate that are acts over too long a time. So they should really be correcting hydroglycemia using glucose mm -hmm. to get it back to normal. It's often wise to also take some longer acting carbohydrate in case it dips again. Mm -hmm. But what they shouldn't do, and what they often I'm afraid do do, is they go and have an enormous bar of chocolate which is actually quite slowly absorbed because of all the fat in it, and they find that their blood glucose is 15 a couple of hours later. So they then have, have to have a corrective dose of insulin, which they will need to have. But they then, perhaps, because they're feeling a bit upset with themselves, they don't have too much, and they end up with it back at three again. Well, is there a handbook written for, for, for living with that, if, if you well, have a variable life, or how, how are patients taught? Okay, so they, they're taught through yeah, the standard answer to that would be that they're taught through the Daphne program, which is now available particularly for ones from type 1 patients. Um, and Daphne stands for Dose Adjustment for Normal Eating. And it's um, a pro an education program taking place over five days. On the original trial that they did, it was five continuous days, I think. Um, but nowadays, they are they provide it <coughs> over you know, one day, over several weeks. So the person in a group setting has to measure their blood glucose levels and it's their help to identify the formula which will work for them in um, getting that getting the doses right. And they get all sorts of other advice about correcting hypoglycemia, so they do get that education. But interestingly they have their own personalized algorithm because the first thing to do is to get the baseline as flat as possible. And for many people you can do that by taking long-acting insulin either once or twice a day. Mm -hmm. Once they've got that right, they're then taught how to have um, a rapid-acting insulin to cover each meal. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they learn a ratio for the amount of insulin versus the amount of carbohydrate they mm -hmm. take in. And then they have to accurately estimate the carbohydrate intake of each meal. And then they should get the, the, um, uh, the dose correct. The difficulty, as I say, is first of all that the baseline is often non-stationary. Uh, it's, you know, it's not flat. Um, and secondly, that these um, meal times overlap and the insulin doses overlap. And that's what's really difficult. And this is why you've got to have that face-to-face -face model in your mind. Now, you imagine you are advised to monitor every four to six hours. Then that's fine because you learn that the outcome of your decisions now four to six hours is this blood glucose level which we hope is normal. After that time, the insulin, the rapid acting insulin we just had will no longer be working. But imagine for some reason you don't feel quite right and you check it up for two hours or one hour even, then you have to take on board the fact that you just had an enormous dose of insulin. And you must imagine it hasn't started working very much yet. You can't apply the same formula now, otherwise you'll overdose yourself. Right. So the person is navigating their way through a world that is uh, full of both quantitative and qualitative data. Yeah. And they are trying to uh, <coughs> avoid bruising their knees on furniture in a way, or worse, yeah. Um, yeah. by steering and sailing close to the wind. Can I ask you about the qualitative versus quantitative? We're seeing um, with the, the breathing that um, Sometimes the, the very same quantitative measures will end up being different, um, giving different um, experiences and abilities to move around and stuff. Is there 
Is there a similar thing with um, blood glucose? Is the, well, or is the is the prick of the blood um, the gold standard? Is that well, the prick of the, prick of the blood. Um, if you if you um, if you go on one of these Daphne courses, for instance, they, they tend to take a view that the person they, they hope that the person will be aware of their hypo symptoms. Quite serious developments if somebody loses their hypo awareness. Um, but unfortunately, that does apply to people. But imagine the person is aware of hypo symptoms, then um, you know they will hopefully this system will work. They won't need to interpret symptoms. Um, belief over where the system is, because unless you keep measuring it every you know, half an hour, you're relying to some extent on your belief of where the system is and where it's going. So um, the, pro the program work, the program works very well, provided there are no huge variations in this sort of regular schedule. Um, well, see, uh, that's what I'm wondering about, because you haven't measured, uh, me mentioned how a person copes with you know, variations in exercise level. Yeah. It seems like you need to have a feel for your body. Do people develop Absolutely. that? Absolutely, and there's an intuitive, there's an intuitive aspect to it. The really difficult thing, I think, and this is, um, goes back a long time now, is that um, the, the, weighing, the traditional weighing scale metaphor um, assumed that you could uh, counterbalance carbs and insulin intake and carbs and exercise separately. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that the exercise alters your sensitivity to insulin. So even though this is still a very simple, possibly only three-dimensional system, it suddenly has become much more difficult because one is not just, it's not, it's not even the case that there's a third tray to this one. It's that one is influencing the response of the other. Okay, yeah. And so that, you know, and of course some people are very good at sort of skills words of balancing these things and others find it much more difficult. And people who have high sort of anxiety levels, I think, are, you know, I've met a lot of patients who have, you know, they've basically been doing this. And, and, and it's difficult to spot them just using HBA and C because um, with those two snooker cube movements, um, the average position of a cube in both cases is the same, right. upright. So if you if you rely, or your, if you base your assessment of stability on the HBA and C, you will fail to detect the difference between somebody who is all over the place but has an adequate average and somebody who is actually well controlled. So we need more adequate the argument, we need more adequate measures based on dynamics for assessing stability and therefore for helping people achieve it behaviourally. Thanks. <coughs> I mean, from what I'm understanding you're saying is, is that the problem with you know people with diabetes is that they've got you know they've as it were, inherited a biological system where they where where variations in glucose are only symptomatic at you know, for, you know extremes of the range so either very high or very low the hyper or the hypo so the balancing act ends up being a very kind of cognitive activity or following numbers really well I mean. I was just wondering, in, the, in, in discussions around how to develop, um, you know, intelligent systems, um, cybernetic systems, really, yeah. for diabetic control, whether there's at one direction of travel is just to make the experience of glucose level more sensory. I mean, there must be technologically ways of doing that, just making the experience think, of glucose variation more sensory, like, like, like thirst and yes. concentration of signs. An obvious way to do that would actually just be to have continuous glucose monitor that is continually displaying the results. You know, I mean, these continuous glucose monitors are still largely used for research purposes, either research purposes or in a clinic to, as in the case of that person who had had it done over three days, identify that they go hyper in the night, which is indeed on that, on that program. But people aren't generally wearing them continuously. But imagine they were able to, and um, they have a, a, the, the current reading display continuously, they would then be aware of it. I have to say, as far as the symptoms are concerned, even though it's a problem in a sense, you know, the, the reduction of blood glucose into the hypo range tr triggers behavioral mechanisms that restore it. In other words, the person feels hypo, goes and has something to eat, and restores it. Um, if you go in the other direction, 
you've got to get really quite high, 16, 17, maybe 20, before you're really aware of it. Um, and, and yet, if it's 12, it's doing you harm in the long run, even though it's not giving you any symptoms. That's part of the problem. I was going to say it's a problem, but on the other hand, I'm not sure that life would be tolerable if you felt as unwell at you know, 10 as you do when you're three. So I wouldn't actually, in a sense, want to encourage the imposition of symptoms on someone if their blood glucose went a bit high, because it might make life impossible. But just a little bit of discomfort, for example, making, it, <laughs> making the whole experience yeah, more embodied. Yeah, it would certainly motivate you to get it right, wouldn't it? Um, and I, but I do think that the, you could achieve, and one, and one of the things that I think would be very interesting experiments to do would be to develop these dynamical indices and then compare the patterns in patients who have got the display on the monitor continuously with people who are blinded to it. In other words, people who, as in the current who have the device we use, the person who had that wood wearing that monitor, this was entirely retrospective analysis, they weren't aware of the glucose level other than doing their own finger pricks, as they would normally have done. But they weren't aware of the, um, of the value, you know, doing it every five minutes, but they weren't aware of the value until the whole thing was taken off and we'll have a look at the last three days. Um, so it would be interesting to know whether the dynamic properties and indeed any other measure of control would be influenced in a productive way by a by minute to minute awareness. But to be honest, yeah, I mean, we all look forward to uh, you know, the invention of the artificial pancreas, making all this research redundant. <laughs> and if you told me in 1974 that Google produced uh, a driverless car before we had an artificial pancreas, I simply wouldn't have believed it. But there we are. Okay, fantastic. So, could I ask um, the other members of the panel, please, just to rejoin us for a minute? And we'll go to, we've got 10 minutes left, we'll go to a brief uh, plenary discussion, as so we did really on the first day. So, do we have any questions for the, the panel as a whole? Okay, I'll kick off one. So, something that seems to come up uh, repeatedly in, in the papers is a very interesting idea of what patients know and how to think about this. And we've had lots and lots of different descriptions. Obviously, we had the um, contrast with black and white data, with hard data. We had um, some of the audience talk about non propositional awareness. We've had talks about embodiment. Um, just here, we talk about an intuitive awareness. And um, do you think there's something, is there something sort of further? and general that we can say about what patients know, or is the best way to look at it just to sort of contrast it with other methods of knowledge, so they don't know it in the way in which you might do all these charts, they have something else, or do you think there's something sort of substantive and positive that you want to say about it? Yeah, so these are the lives you can just use. I think, I don't think it's, it's the contrast, I think it's the, the complementary um, the way to look at it. I mean, certainly, I think the interesting thing about the diabetes is it's one of those conditions where, in contrast to COPD, you don't have the symptoms yet. You still have an, an underlying condition that needs to be treated. Whereas, of course, COPD, people are constantly breathless, so they're constantly aware of their condition and how to respond to it. But I, I see that patient knowledge complementing the, sort of the, the heart signs, you see what I mean, you know, the sort of clinical <coughs> signs and symptoms, rather than it's being a I think, I think you have to recognise, though, that um, all patients' awareness, um, you know, the, if you are seeing the patient in the role of interpreting whatever the data are, then you have to help them to do that well, to do that appropriately, without assuming that they would know without any instruction. Because I think there is potential, certainly in the diabetes case, there's huge potential for you know, behaviour in closing this loop and, and improving outcomes. But you see so many examples of where it backfires. So I think it's something that really needs a lot of thought. George, I don't know that's um... Sounds good. But no, I, I think it's <coughs> this kind of conference is exactly the kind of 
places where we can get you know, headaches and patients and people from arts and humanities and social science talking together. And in some ways, that's, um, that's a really important and kind of relatively new thing, um, is moving away from kind of siloing of information, so thinking that expertise can't be co-developed, it can't be synthesized or shared. Can I ask you just uh, just a sociological question. So something that came up in a lot of what you said sort of between the lines was the idea that this kind of appeal to what the patient is is resisted by certain members of, of I suppose, the medical community broadly. I mean, am I reading that right? So there was a remark you made where um, I think perhaps this kind of perspective hasn't been taken into account as much as it should have been, or and presumably some people will see this kind of type of discussion as just an anecdote. I mean, is that just sociologically? I mean, are, are there, is that a perspective that's alive and well within the medical community, or do you think people are coming around your way of thinking more? I think in the case of diabetes, there's, you know, there's been a very definite sort of move away from the sort of paternalism of the sort of 40 years ago. On the other hand, there was a very good basis for that paternalism because before the advent of self monitoring, the clinician had to do their best to help the patient by saying, you know, I think you should take um, these doses of insulin, and I think you should eat regularly, and that, and that it's like a driverless train, and it should be okay. And what I did, you, you know, you follow that pattern. But since then, now, with the invention of self-monitoring, we now, by educating the patient, can have a driverless car, and, um, you know, that is absolutely a fundamental difference. And the result of it has been, I think this is one of the most important things that's happened you know, in the last sort of 30 years in diabetes, is this move towards patient-centered models and towards a recognition that actually flexibility is the basis of stability rather than regularity. If you go back 30 years, everybody would have said that the basis for state stability <coughs> is regularity, regularity of timing of meals, regularity of carbohydrate intake, regularity of insulin doses. That's your only chance of remaining stable. And we will tweak it till we get it right, and then you just keep doing that. And now, a bit like with balancing the snooker cube on the deck of the ship, we recognize that we're in a different world, it's a different landscape, and patients are gonna be more stable if they can navigate themselves and be flexible about what they eat, and any way they're going to want to do that anyway. That's very helpful. Do I think we ought to go on? Does that sound? Um, one thing I would say, that's in my group, um, sorry, one thing that hasn't, um, that hasn't come up in this session is talking about medical education and, um, and CPD. And I think these are also very important places where these kinds of conversations can, can take place. And, um, and especially when I'm teaching medical students, you've got a pretty, good, well, on the one hand, good combination, but on the other hand, it's, it's people with, who are very young who have had, you know, fairly good, stable life experiences, um, and a kind of ferocious intelligence. And, and if, if you don't expose them to the kind of nuance and complexity and, and hardship involved in having illness or treating illness or working in a healthcare setting, I think that there's, there's a lot to lose by that. So that's another place where I think it's very useful to have um, exposure to kind of insights from quality research from um, arts and humanities and social sciences and, and from the location perspective. But I think from my limited experience with, with medical schools, that's, that's um, not done as regularly and as comprehensively as I'm very glad that sounds right to you as well. Yeah, no, I agree with what Pavi said about education, probably not just for, for medics, but also the adult health professionals. But I think also the other drivers, probably about policy shift now, so much.
Fantastic. We have time for one more. If anyone wants a question on the panel in general. No? Okay. So we've answered all the questions. So at that uh, point, I would like to ask you strongly to thank our panelists and, of course, also our organizers and uh, everyone who's helped out in putting this all together. Thanks to everyone for coming. I, I was going to try to say a few things to draw out threads that were overlapping and uh, intersections and parallels and so on, uh, but it's overwhelming actually how much there was in, in uh, the two days, so I'm not going to try to do that. Um, there will be a video of the whole thing, so you can do that for yourself. In a couple of weeks, uh, after it's edited for all the times when I say, please use the microphone, um, it will be on our website, philosophyandmedicine.org. And uh, also on the website is a call for papers that we're doing for the same theme, self-knowledge in and out of illness. There's going to be an edited volume with um, some of the talks in uh, this symposium becoming papers and being put in there, but also a call for other people to uh, propose papers on the, the topic more broadly, not restricted to what we've talked about here. Um, and you can find that on our website as well. Uh, and thank you all for coming. We will have more activities next school year. Colloquium happens every two weeks. There's an annual lecture, um, hopefully another symposium next spring, and an essay contest. Um, so stay tuned on our website, and thank you once again for coming. And thank you to the speakers, all the speakers, for sharing your time and your um, expertise with us. Thanks.